um, our entire year has kind of been moving us towards the Civil War and Reconstruction. Like, and so for students thinking about race and thinking about slavery and thinking about like um, privilege and power and thinking about our government, all of those things come into play with the Civil War. And so for my students really to just start to connect those issues and connect those ideas that they've been wrestling with all year, that's really what I wanted this discussion to be about. Um, in a lot of ways, I think that that is responsive to like my students because the society that we live in today is still dealing with the issues and the repercussions of like what happened within like the system of slavery that have happened like after uh, the Civil War with Reconstruction, um, and backlash and like white privilege. Those things are still in our society today, and so I feel like this is the kind of di uh, discussion and topic that students will continue to have into adulthood. Um, our earlier discussions around the Civil War. Most of your classmates agreed that the Civil War was inevitable, like it was bound to happen. But if we were to look back at the causes of the Civil War, at what point does the Civil War become inevitable? At what point is there no turning back? In 1854, like the, after the Kansas and Nebraska Act, where they made Kansas like popular sovereignty, half of it was anti-slavery and half was pro-slavery. And so that was when they started fighting about uh, whether slavery should be kept or not. And so I think that um, after that happened, that the war was like starting to start. I feel like another one of the boiling points was that when Lincoln took office because I understand it that, well, it was when the election started happening, they, like they knew most likely Lincoln was gonna win. I think that's when they felt like they was gonna be treated differently because of the other presidents that they had felt like it was okay to have slavery. And I'm kind of agree. I'm agreeing with Lauren and Abdi. Like some, like what Abdi said, how the how like the slaves started to rebel against their masters because they started seeing the way that the other people was being treated. And most of the time, I agree with everyone that said like the secession is the tipping point of the Civil War. But also like the way that there was like half free states and half slave states. I think like the tipping point for the secession to happen also was like California. California entered the Union as a as a free state and it had uh, two senators. So that caused like an imbalance and the North now had more like, more like it had one more state and two more senators. So like the South, I felt like, felt like a little more powerless against the North. And so they thought that if they became their own nation, then that they could like just do whatever they wanted. And also like the whole question about was the Civil War inevitable? It was because Lincoln going into office pushed people to like, like force the North and the South to talk about um, slavery. And slavery is not a small issue, it's a real big issue. And so there's no such thing as, there's no like a compromise where you can reach where both the North and the South can be happy. Because there's this issue that seems to be kind of bubbling. Like Blaine, you first brought it up when you said slavery is not like some little issue. Like it's not something that you can kind of like compromise over. And then I think you guys really took it into specifics talking about um, like how slavery is about like in the United States removal of personhood and dehumanization. Like we're gonna treat them like animals, or we're gonna treat them like property. If that's the case, could the North have just let the South go and accepted like the continuation of slavery or was the North in a position where they had to react? The North could have let them go. Like in theory, like anybody can do anything. But now should they have let them go is a better question. No, they shouldn't have let them go because then if they had let them go, slavery would have kept like going on. So one of the things that we really wanted to make sure is that kids were becoming aware of how much they participated and how they created space for students or prevented other students from participating in the discussion. Um, and so one of the things that we asked of them is that when they were participating, they're thinking about their voice in balance with their peers' voice. But we wanted them to understand that this kind of academic discourse and discussion was both about speaking but also about listening. And so putting that as a value in the grading really helps students kind of see that, I think. Um, and as a value on the rubric. Also, another part was propelling the discussion, which is about asking questions, about responding to what you heard other students say. Um, and really that rubric has allowed myself and my partner teacher to like 
engage our students in a new and different way in discussion. Julia, anything that you want to add? I know we've talked about a lot of things, so any issues or ideas that you wanted to express while we're sitting here at the table? Okay, I agree with Jasmine because like, if you grow up around something thinking that it's like okay your whole life, then you're gonna just go out into the world and think that that's okay, so. Is there a way to change that? Like, or is there a way to challenge that? Yeah, but it's gonna be hard to like, like take away something that you thought was okay. How can that change happen? Are we still in that process of changing, like now in the United States? Like, are we continuing to make progress? I'd say probably a little bit, except for the part when, like, there are white policemen shooting, like, black children and black people. So, I mean, I'm not saying that that's, like, progress making, but it's, like, I feel like uh, more black people got a little more rights than they had before because at least like people aren't um, black people aren't slaves and stuff anymore. But the point, like that's not the point. Like we may have our freedom and stuff, but white people, um, some white people um, are still obsessed about what happened like all those years ago and mm -hmm. still want things to be the way they were. So slavery was a big problem, yeah. and it's still today because like people are getting shot and people don't give that much attention to black people. I think we could continue uh, into like three more class periods as you guys are coming up with all these great connections, but I wanna make sure you guys get a chance to uh, reflect and that those of you who are outside get a chance to give some feedback for those folks who spoke today. Um, for those of you around the table, I'm gonna give you your little reflection sheets. I think one of the things that we realized is that students needed to build their ability to write and provide evidence and reasoning for their ideas. And so one of the first things we did in um, our class was really start to build how do you collect evidence, how do you choose evidence, and how do you then reason with that evidence and those ideas. Um, from there, building on evidence and building their writing capacity, then also building in time for discussion and allowing students to participate in small group discussions. Um, to participate in whole class discussions, to create a space where, as the teacher, I'm not leading the discussion. My job is merely the recorder. As a teacher, if I was like, these are the four questions that we need to follow, and that's my discussion, because I run it. Like, that's not responsive to my students. What my kids talked about in this last period um, was not necessarily what I had intended. They took it a whole different route, and it's so fun for me as a teacher to go back and look at my notes from all of my discussions and see like, whoa, fourth period like totally went down this path and like connecting it to like familial like struggle and strife and discordance. Well, second period totally took it to the prison industrial complex or like, so being able to find different connections um, and the class and the students being able to direct where they're going, that in and of itself I think is really responsive because it, meets the kids where they're at, but it also allows them like the power to choose. And that's really important for our students. We did some practice, like after we do warm up sometimes, she'll be like, I won't call on students, but you can start the conversation. So we have like a class, like a whole class discussion sometimes on a topic from our warm up. Mm -hmm. And so that's like really helpful that we get that practice once in a while. And um, also like she, like she's just like, that practice really does help to like talk to other students. In my class, I feel like really fortunate to have um, a second period class where I feel comfortable talking to all the students because I feel like if I didn't get to know them all, all like the first couple months, then I wouldn't feel comfortable talking to people because with people I'm not comfortable with. I don't talk to them as openly as I do with my second period. So I feel fortunate that Miss Lane made it such a comfortable environment.